Well, good morning again. Grab your Bibles. Mark chapter 12 is where we will be this morning as we continue to walk through the Bible chapter by chapter, verse by verse. If you don't have a Bible, it should be a hardback one somewhere around you. You can follow along on the screen, your phone, whatever is comfortable to you. You know, when we left off last week, Jesus was in the middle of debating the religious leaders who had, who had come to challenge him after he had cleared the temple. And if you remember, they also demanded that he proved where his authority came from. So he asked them, from where did John the Baptist get his authority? So instead of answering him, they plead ignorance, right? So Jesus refuses to answer them. And then they try to trip him up in a trap whether or not they're supposed to be paying taxes. And as I mentioned last week, these verses, these last verses are really summing up the current state of the Jewish religious system, how corrupt it really was, how unfruitful it was, and how far away from God they truly were. And now they bring some thorny theological questions to Jesus as they begin to this like tag team approach. And this becomes almost a desperate uh, plea in their attempt to discredit and get rid of Jesus. They've, they've thrown everything at him, and now they're going to try just a little bit harder. So let's get going. Mark chapter 12, and we begin in verse 18. <coughs> Some Sadducees who say there is no resurrection came to Jesus and began questioning him, saying, so we're going to pause there for a second. So this is the only place in Mark where Sadducees are, are mentioned. And the Sadducees were rationalists, whereas the Pharisees were moralists. And these two groups exist even today. They're still around. Now a moralist might admit there is a God, but reaching God is up to you, up to your efforts, and up to our own measurements. Whereas a rationalist, they need proof. That they can see because they don't have anything in their, their uh, uh, philosophy for anything supernatural. The Sadducees and the Pharisees, they were actually enemies. They did not get along. And we see several places in the New Testament where Peter or people like Peter and Paul, they actually leverage their dislike for one another to their own advantage. So the Sadducees also only accepted the law of Moses as their religious authority. So if the doctrine could not be defended from the first five books of the Old Testament, then they wouldn't accept it. It didn't, it didn't matter. It didn't exist to them. And they also did not believe in the existence of a soul, afterlife, life after death, the resurrection, final judgments, angels, or demons, or anything supernatural. Most of the Sadducees were actually priests during that day, and they were actually very wealthy. And they, tend, they considered themselves to be these religious aristocrats if you will and they looked down on everybody else they also favored working with the Romans because that's how they achieved um, earthly wealth and that's where the dissension really came in between the Pharisees and the Sadducees was because of that so now they're actually working together we've seen that they kind of came together for the common goal and the common goal was to get rid of Jesus because he was causing all these issues and so the Sadducee comes to Jesus and he asks this question. <clears throat> Verse 19. Teacher, Moses wrote for us that if a man's brother dies and leaves behind a wife and leaves no child, his brother should marry the wife and raise up children to his brother. So the Sadducees, they bring this hypothetical question to Jesus, which was based on marriage as given in Deuteronomy 25, 7 through 10, which basically states that if a man dies before having a son, his brother or nearest male relative is to marry the widow, and the first son would technically be the heir of the dead man, making sure that the Israelites and the widow didn't lose the property. And this was called the, the Leverate Law. And we see this law in the book of Ruth. And this law was designed, again, to protect the widow who had no rights in that culture at the time. So it would protect her so she wouldn't lose everything that her husband had before he passed. Verse 20. <coughs> there were seven brothers, 
and the first took a wife and died leaving no children. The second one married her and died leaving behind no children. And the third likewise. And all seven left no children. Last of all, the woman also, that woman died also. In the resurrection, when they rise again, which one's wife will she be? For all seven had married her. So this appears to be an argument that the Sadducee makes that they, he has used this argument before when he was talking to the Pharisees in their debates. So he, he decides, hey, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bring it in front of Jesus because I'm going to embarrass Jesus with this. But it's odd how he even mentions the re word resurrection because he don't believe in it, right? But he mentions it. But it's there to show the ridiculousness of believing in the afterlife. That's what he's trying to prove. And that's the type of question that me and you, we often hear from unbelievers, right? One in particular I hear all the time, can God make a rock so big that even he can't pick it up? That's a question I hear. People do this as a way to sidestep the, the main issue, which is whether or not you are willing to put your faith and trust in Christ alone. So remember, when you talk about the things of God, it's important to stick to the main thing, which is the gospel, before moving on to the finer points of theology, because they will sidetrack you. Anybody you're talking to that is not a believer about the gospel, they will start asking you the craziest questions you've ever heard in your life, trying to sidetrack you. Get the gospel in first. And then if you have time, talk about the other issues. But because, like most unbelievers, these Sadducees thought, hey man, I'm a lot more intelligent than these, these Christians. Right? I'm a lot more intelligent than Jesus. But Jesus reveals their ignorance of two things. The power of God and the truth of Scripture. And being rationalists, the Sadducees see the resurrection if there was one in their mind, to just be a continuation of the way they lived on earth. Like it wasn't different. It was just the same. We just get resurrected. We go back to living, living on the earth. And that suddenly there would be these seven husbands and this one wife, and they wouldn't know what to do. But the problem is the Sadducees had made God in man's image. And there was no room in their minds that God could both resurrect people and give them a new life give them a different life verse 24 <clears throat> Jesus said to them is it not the reason is this not the reason you are mistaken that you do not understand the scriptures or the power of God Jesus says you are mistaken which is the Greek word that means to wander. It also can mean to go astray, to, to err, or to be deceived. So they came to the wrong conclusion, is what Christ is telling them, because they placed their own values on top of Scripture instead of letting Scripture dictate their lives. So they err in two ways. One, the misinterpretation of Scripture, and devaluing the power that God has. Because God does, in fact, speak of the resurrection in the Old Testament, including in the, the Pentateuch. They misunderstand the very nature of God, the very power of God, as being a life-giving spirit capable of resurrection and recreating the world. You see, the resurrection is not the restoration of life as we know it. It is the entrance into a new life that is different. New bodies that we will need for a new life in heaven. So Jesus begins to build upon his proof that even Moses taught the continuation of life after death. Verse 25. For when they rise from the dead, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like angels in heaven. Now notice Jesus says, when. When. Meaning, resurrection is a fact. And the Sadducees were simply wrong. They were incorrect. And further, Jesus says there will be no new marriage in heaven. They neither marry or are given in marriage. We will be like angels in that we do not marry or propagate, but live eternally. Now, how all that works, I don't know. Don't ask me because I don't know. Right? We don't know enough about heaven to know all this. 
But that's not Jesus' point. Jesus' point is correcting them. Verse 26. But regarding the fact that the dead rise again, have you not read in the book of Moses, in the passage about the burning bush, how God spoke to him saying, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. He is not the God of the dead, but, uh, but of the living. You are greatly mistaken. So he ups it. You are greatly mistaken. You are greatly deceived. So since the Sadducees, they didn't see resurrection in the books of Moses, Jesus takes them to the scriptures. They recognize and they show, he shows that God is the God of men long dead. And the reference is from Exodus 3. And I like how Jesus tells them they are greatly mistaken. They're greatly deceived. Like, you don't even, you're not even the same ballpark I'm in. Like, I don't know where you ended up, but you're not where you're supposed to be. Because you see, God did not tell Moses that he was, past tense, he was the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. No, he says, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. The patriarchs were alive when God spoke this to Moses. Therefore, Moses does teach that there is life after death. And what's amazing is whenever Jesus comes into a life, if we will sit and listen, if we will sit and realize, he will clear away any deception. He'll clear away any doubts in our heads. Verse 28. One of the scribes came and heard them arguing and recognized that he had answered them well. Asked him, what commandment is the foremost of all? And Jesus answered, the foremost is, hear, O Israel. The Lord our God is one Lord. And you shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your mind, and with all of your strength. And the second is this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment. That is greater than these. So this challenger seems to come up with a sincere question. And we know from Matthew 22, 30, 34 through 35 that he is a scribe. But he's a scribe that's a Pharisee. And interesting to note that scribes had determined that the Jews were obligated to obey 613 precepts in the law. That's a lot of things to obey, right? I mean, we can't even obey our parents. And they're talking 613 different laws we have to obey. 365 negative, 248 positive precepts. And one of their favorite exercises was discussing which one of these divine commandments was the greatest. Which one is the greatest? So the Lord answers him, quoting Deuteronomy 6, 4-5, <clears throat> Which is the great confession that's recited even to this day. Every morning and every evening, it is known as the Shema from the word of the confession, which means to hear. Then the Lord quotes Leviticus 19.18, which emphasizes love for your neighbor. Jesus makes love the most important thing in life. Why do you think that is? It's because love fulfills the law you see if we love God we experience his, we experience his love within and we express that love to other people we do not live by rules we live by relationships a loving relationship with God enables us to have a loving relationship with other people that's like I always tell you that's a barometer of where your love is for God is how you treat other people. That's how you can tell. And Jesus repeats these words later when he tells his men in John 13, 34 through 35. He says, I give you a new commandment. Love one another. Just as I have loved you, you must love one another. I love that word, must. It doesn't say if you want to, on occasion, whenever you feel like it. It says you must love one another. And he hits this right in the heart, doesn't he? Verse 32. The scribe said to him, Right, teacher, 
You have truly stated that he is one, and there is no one besides him. And to love him with all of your heart, and with all of your understanding, and with all of your strength, and to love one's neighbor as himself, is much more than all burnt offerings and sacrifices. You almost want to applaud this guy, right? He's like, you get it. You get it. And even though the religious leaders, they love to debate about the importance of the laws and the rules and the regulations, this man marvels that Jesus could break, the, break all that down into two simple statements, which basically is love God, love people. This man who started a conversation with Jesus, who was being used as a tool of the Pharisees, trying to get evidence to, against Jesus... Here's Jesus' answer, and he dares to commend Jesus for his reply. He says, you've got it. But you see, the word had spoken to this man's heart. And he was beginning to get this deeper spiritual understanding of the faith that he thought he understood. That there was much more to the Jewish religion than offering sacrifices and keeping laws. There's much more to it. There's much more to the religion than just keeping laws. That, in the end, it's all about one thing. Selfless love. Not selfish, selfless love. It is sin and brokenness that has made it so difficult, so complicated. We like to muck everything up. This man was actually using his head, and Jesus applauds him for that. But like the rich young ruler, Jesus prods the man to take his thoughts and turn them into trust in him. You see, eventually it has to turn. The conversation has to turn. <clears throat> Verse 34. When Jesus saw that he answered intelligently, he said to him, You are not far from the kingdom of God. After that, no one would venture to ask him any more questions. Notice Jesus doesn't say, Hey, you're already there. You've already alive, uh, arrived. But the man was not, was not far. You see, we can give all the right answers. We can go through all the right motions. We can recite all the right things and still not have a relationship with Jesus Christ. Not being far from the kingdom of God means facing truth honestly. And this man was facing truth honestly. It's not interested in defending a party line or defending uh, personal prejudice. The man was not defending anything. He was facing truth honestly. And it means the person is testing his or her faith by what the Word of God says and not by what some religious group demands or says. You see, I can tell you all day long what Christ tells you in Scripture, but until you read it yourself, it really doesn't mean a whole lot. People close to the kingdom have courage to stand up for what is true, even if they're going to lose some friends, even if they're going to make some new enemies. And after this conversation, the group of leaders were done. They had spent all their ammunition, and in the end, God's word, Jesus Christ, in the end, some of these people were ready to repent and believe the man who was their enemy. <laughs> That's the power of God's word. Me and you don't possess that. But God does, right? And so they, they give up. They give up. But later they're going to turn to much more sinister methods. They're going to, as we know, they're going to kill him. <clears throat> so then Jesus, he begins to ask them some questions. Verse 35. And Jesus began to say, as he taught in the temple, how is it 
that the scribes say that Christ is the son of David. David himself said in the Holy Spirit, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I put your enemies beneath your feet. David calls himself Lord. So in what sense is he his son? And the large crowd enjoyed listening to him. So Jesus brings us all back around and immediately turns the focus toward one essential question that we all must ask. Who is the Messiah? Who is he? Because every other theological debate is irrelevant before coming to terms with that question. Is Jesus the Messiah? The question is far more important than any of the ones that they asked Jesus. For if we are wrong about Jesus Christ, we are wrong about salvation, which means in the end, we end up condemning our own souls. So Jesus shows that the Messiah would come from David's line. And we know this because of key verses throughout the Old Testament. Like 2 Samuel 7, 12-14 is a really good one. It says, when your time comes and you rest with your fathers, I will raise up after you your descendant from who will come from your body and I will establish his kingdom. He will build a house for my name and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be a father to him and he will be a son to me. It's talking about Christ. And here in verse 36, Jesus quotes Psalms 110.1. And then he proceeds to ask them to explain how David's son could also be David's Lord. How is that possible that his sons could be his Lord? You see, the Jews did believe that Messiah would be David's son. But the only way David's son could also be David's Lord is if he was the Messiah, if he were God come in human flesh. It's the only way. So how is that possible? Well, the answer, of course, comes from Jesus' miraculous conception and virgin birth. But the religious leader, they don't understand that Jesus would be much more than this human descendant of David. That he would also be, he would also be God. So Jesus is declaring himself to be the Messiah as the descendant of David. And he lifts the veil of his divinity. The crowds were delighted. The crowds rejoiced. The leaders, not so much. Not so much, right? <clears throat> so this section closes with a warning against the pride of the scribes. If a person is important only because of a uniform he wears the title he bears, or the office he holds, then his imp importance is actually artificial. It is the character that makes a person valuable, and nobody can give you character. You must develop character. You must develop it yourself as you walk with God. That's what develops your character as you walk with God. And in a way, you could sum up verses 18 through 37 by saying that we greatly misunderstand who God is. Because we tend to overlay our framework of reference over God, just like the Sadducees did. We tend to do that. Even some of the most devout Christians I've ever met still have a habit of doing this. It's because we live in a broken and fallen world. But we lay our framework over over God. Well, my God would never do that. Well, you're probably right, because he doesn't exist. But the God of the Bible does exist. So we have, to be under, we have to be careful of that. But when we understand who God is, we see that living with him is much more different than what we think. And that loving God is much more encompassing, a much more encompassing experience than we have ever imagined. So how do we write this overlay of our framework? Well, it begins with what Jesus just did. We look at Scripture. What, is, what does it say about the person of God? What does it say about God's Messiah? 
That's exactly what Jesus did to the scribe in pointing out the most important commandments, which is love God, love people. Jesus focused on correctly understanding who God is, his nature, and his debate forced them to focus further on the Messiah. Because in the end, it does matter what we think about Jesus. What matters is we think what we think about who Jesus is. Not that every theological question is ever going to be answered, because it's not. But who he is. That he is God incarnate. He is both man and God at the same time. That he is born of a virgin. He lived a sinless life. And he died to pay a sin fine that you and me owe. And then he was raised on the third day as proof that what he did was enough. He paid our sin debt, guys. And in order to get that covering from him, all we have to do is put our, we repent and put our trust in him. That's it. It's free. He doesn't ask for it back. We just have to humble ourselves. And that whomever will believe upon him will have eternal life. And because of him, we are now in right standing with God. How can we say we're righteous? Because of Christ. It's Christ's righteousness, not ours. So make sure you have the right Jesus. Make sure you have the Jesus of the Bible. Make sure you have the Jesus who died and said it is finished. It was, all, it was done. He did 100% of the work. Because any Jesus that does 99.9% .9 is not the Jesus of the Bible. Because he won't save you. Trust me, he will not save you. Because life with Jesus, I'm telling you, is heavenly. It's amazing. But life without him, it's going to be hell. Literally. Not be good. So my encouragement for you this week is to take the scripture and realize who God truly is. Who Christ truly is. What does scripture say about who he is? Not what I say about who he is. Not what you say about who he is. What does scripture tell us who he is? And start chipping away at that overlay who we think he is. And we get to know who he really is. Because I'm telling you, that relationship is completely different. And it's amazing. And it all begins right there with loving God and loving people. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, I thank you again so much for, Lord, for this morning, for our time together, and Lord, most of all, for, for your word. Because, Lord, it's your word that convicts us. It's your word that changes people. It's your word that brings people to salvation. Not our crafty little tricks or any of that. But you through your Son, who's our Savior. Lord, we have a right standing because of Him. We have righteousness because of Him. And Lord, I pray this morning that you forgive us all of our sins that we have committed this week, not because we earn or that we, we deserve those <laughs> to be wiped away, but because your Son wiped them away for us. That's where our hope rests, in your Son. Lord, if there's someone here this morning that does not truly know you or online, Father, I pray this morning that they come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, that you awaken their hearts to the truth, because today is the day of salvation. Lord, awaken them to repentance and faith. And Lord, we thank you so much. We love you, and it's in your Son's name, Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen.